Hello and welcome to the Hanseatic League, a podcast by the history of the Germans. Episode 9. Embargoes. The Hanseatic League undergoes a fundamental transformation in the second half of the 14th century. It turned from a guild of merchants trading across the Baltic and the North Sea into an alliance of trading cities. An alliance that had proven that it can fight and win wars against major territorial powers. And that sits quite uncomfortably with the existing European rulers who wonder what to do with this alien inside their body politic. The Hanse had acquired a wide range of trading privileges in their main contours in England, Flanders, Norway and the Republic of Novgorod. And these privileges did not only disadvantage the locals, who were unsurprisingly hostile, but also challenged the authority of the princes. That was just about bearable as long as it was a community of grubby merchants from the empire. But now that these merchants had built formidable cities, had commanded great navies and toppled kings, it became an entirely different ballgame. Furthermore, the legitimacy of the Hanse was quite fragile. The Hanseatic cities, while apart from Lübeck and Dortmund, weren't free imperial cities, making them at least formally subject to their territorial lords. As such, they could not form an actual league of cities as the northern Italian republics had done a hundred years earlier, nor were they allowed to conduct foreign policy against their territorial lord, though they sometimes did. These fault lines will become ever more apparent as we go forward with our history. Now this week we'll get a first glimpse at what will lead to the ultimate demise of the League as we get into the year 1388, a year when the cities face off against three of the most powerful political entities in Northern Europe, the Kingdom of England, the County of Flanders and the Republic of Novgorod. But before we start, allow me to make you an offer you cannot refuse. From here on out, I will provide you with an episode of the History of the Germans almost every Thursday at 0500 UK time, advertising free with a modest amount of humor and an excessive amount of detail. In exchange, you help and support the podcast. You can do that by becoming a patron on patreon.com slash history of the Germans from as little as two of the shiniest British pounds per month. Or by making a one-time contribution on my website, historyofthegermans.com slash support. If you want to help in another way, go out and tell everyone. Friends, family, acquaintances, colleagues, people in the shops and people on the street that you love the show. Word of mouth remains one of the most effective ways of bringing in new listeners. And thanks a lot to Warren W., Axel G., Michael O. and Reed P., who've made generous one-time donations and some of them had made them more than once. Your support is very, very much appreciated. Last week, we ended on the Peace of Stralsund, the masterpiece of the diplomacy of Henning von Putbus, the leader of the Danish Royal Council. After the crushing defeat at the hands of the Hanseatic League and its allies, King Waldemar Atterdag, and even the Kingdom of Denmark itself had been done for. The Allies' intent was to turn the clock back to 1340, when the kingdom did not have a ruler. Its great provinces had been mortgaged to the German princes and the Hanse controlled the Öresund, as well as the herring market in Scania. By driving a wedge between the Hanse, whose interests were mainly mercantile, and its allies, the Counts of Holstein, the Duke of Mecklenburg and some of the great aristocratic Danish families, whose interests were purely territorial, Henning von Putbus managed to preserve the kingdom of his absent monarch. It came at a price, though. Denmark had to cede the main castles that controlled the passage between the Baltic and the North Sea to the Hanse for a term of 15 years. Throughout that period, the Hanse could collect two-thirds of the tolls for the use of the Öresund, and even more important, could control who was allowed to go through and who wasn't. Being able to block access gave the Hanse a monopoly in all trade with the northeast of Europe. The Hanse had control of the export of Baltic herring, the staple of the European diet, of the finest beeswax that lit up the great cathedral and monasteries, and of the large shipments of grain from the hinterland of Pomerania, Prussia and Livonia that fed the cities of Flanders and England. 
The final concession Putbus had to make to secure a deal was to give these plebeian merchants a say in who would become the king of Denmark once Valdemar Atterdag were to die. Now, by the way, I initially called him Valdemar Dorn, which is a translation of the Danish word Atterdag, but I found it much more fun to say the word Atterdag than the word Dorn. And if you search for Valdemar Dorn on Google, you'll struggle to find anything useful, whilst Valdemar Atterdag will get you straight to where you want to go. So, Valdemar Atterdag, he had no son. With his current wife, still very much alive and past childbearing age, the succession was likely to go through one of his daughters. The older, Ingeborg, was married to Henry of Mecklenburg, who in turn was the brother of the current king of Sweden, as well as the son of the Duke of Mecklenburg. The younger one, Margaret, was married to Hakon, the king of Norway. Both of them had male children. Ingeborg's son was called Albrecht and Margaret's was called Olaf. Both were infants in 1375, meaning that their guardians, i.e. either the Duke of Mecklenburg or the King of Norway, would effectively rule Denmark. 1375 was also the year that King Valdemar Atterdag passed away. When the Royal Council of Denmark asked the Hanse who amongst these two pretenders they were to prefer, the Hanse went for the Norway option. King Olaf II, who was five at the time. That seemed like the right decision since the Mecklenburger already had Sweden and were the overlords of Rostock and Wismar. It seemed a lot better to let the Norwegians have Denmark. Norway was a lot smaller than Sweden, further away, and as we heard before in the episode about Bergen, utterly dependent upon the grain shipments from Lübeck and Prussia. Now, this was one of those decisions that were entirely rational, sensible at the time, but turned out to have been majorly wrong in hindsight. What the Burgermeisters and the city councillors did not know, and probably could not even have imagined, was that Margaret, youngest daughter of Valdemar Atterdag, mother of King Olaf II, was the greatest Scandinavian politician of the Middle Ages. Full stop. I heard the historian Simon Sebak Montefiore saying on a different podcast that there is a fashion to elevate the role of women in history. Presumably he means beyond of what their actual impact warrants. Now, that may be so, but in the case of Margaret of Denmark, there is no bigging up possible. She is undeniably an exceptional political operator, a crucial figure in Scandinavian history, and the Hanses' most formidable opponent. But for now, we should park Margaret in the back of our minds. She will make her presence felt very soon. For now we need to contemplate how the rest of Northern Europe felt about an association of cities taking charge of the fate of entire kingdoms. For the last 150 years or so, the Counts of Flanders, the Kings of England and the rulers of Norway and Novgorod had regarded the men who had come on their cocks from the east with furs, beesmax, grain, copper and what not as merchants. Which is not surprising given that is exactly what they were. But in these years from 1360 onwards, it had become clear that they were not just merchants. They had proven they could muster a navy that could bring down a king any time they so wanted. And if the Hanse was not just a trading association but a political power, then the trading privileges they held in Flanders, England and Novgorod take on a very different meaning. No longer are they concessions made to attract trade and grow their own markets. There are concessions to a foreign power that can use the benefit to fit out ships that could attack the harbors and castles of their hosts. Moreover, some of these privileges allowed the Hansards to operate outside the jurisdictions of the local rulers. Cases against them for breach of contract had to be brought before their judges, not to the local magistrate. In criminal cases, they were either immune from the royal officials or could be smuggled out of the country before they could be brought to heel. In a world where the monarchies move gradually towards a modern understanding of the state as the holder of a monopoly on violence, these ancient privileges become increasingly hard to swallow. And all these misgivings are boosted by the constant complaints of the locals. The ruler's own subjects have to cough up for all the tolls and taxes these foreigners do not have to pay. 
The Hansards have privileges in the markets and in many places can even compete directly with their commerce by selling to retail customers. And finally, along with the growing role of the state comes the understanding that all this economic activity actually matters. In 1319, England establishes the Company of the Merchants of the Staple by Royal Charter. The merchants of the stable are given the monopoly in the trade with wool, leather, lead and tin. And that was intended both to concentrate the trade, to making it more efficient, as well as facilitating the collection of taxes and dues. A little later, a competing association is formed, the Merchant Adventurers, who trade in all the goods not covered by the monopoly of the merchants of the staple. They too receive a royal charter in 1407, and their major competitors are the Hansards. All these tensions result in an almighty blow-up in 1388, and it did not happen in just one place, but in three places, all at the same time. Let's start with events in Flanders. When we left the scene in Bruges in 1360, the Hanse had just achieved a major victory. The city of Bruges had attempted to curtail the Hanse's privileges. In response, the Hansard staged a walkout, thereby cutting Bruges off from supply of goods from the Baltic. Amongst those was the grain from Prussia, and that was the one that hurt the most. Bread prices for the lower classes in the overcrowded city went up, there was fear of rights, and the citizens of Bruges, still the largest and the most important trading place in northern Europe, had to cave to the Hansa. For the subsequent 15 years, things went reasonably smoothly, but by 1375, tensions rose again. The members of the Contour complained to the Hansetag that Bruges was claiming import tax on the stockfish from Bergen, that they had banned the import of Hamburg beer, and that the city authorities were unwilling to prevent the attacks on their warehouses and then failed to honour claims for damages. The Hansetag sent a delegation to Bruges to negotiate, but they ran into a brick wall. After the delegation had returned back home empty-handed, the Hansards in Bruges decided to take things into their own hands and stage another walkout. They had to plan this in secrecy, not only because they did not want to give the city or the Count of Flanders a chance to stop them, but also because they were no longer allowed to steer the policy of the Contour themselves. Now, initially, the Contours were managed by the merchants who were on location at any given time. These merchants would select their older men and then make the decisions about how to handle any conflict with the locals. In 1366, the cities and the Hansetag had taken over direct control of the contours. From now on, all major decisions had to be taken by the Hansetag or one of the city's representatives on site. Back in 1378, something went wrong in the process, and the secret of the planned walkout came out before the Hansards could get themselves and their wares out of the city. The Count of Flanders was apoplectic and had the merchants thrown in jail and their goods sequestered. Since they had acted without permission from back home, the Contour did not get any support from the Hansetag. So caught in the middle, the German merchants in Bruges had to swallow the demands of the Count of Flanders. They were made to stay and to trade from their now much less privileged position. And once released from prison, they wrote a bitter letter back to Lübeck. Quote, now that you, the lords of the cities, are in charge of us, they may also deliberate on the disgrace that has been done to us, for we did not want to give up our privileges. End quote. This is now quite embarrassing for the cities. They had wanted to take control of the contours, and upon the first challenge, the new system had utterly failed. They had to do something. Sending a letter of protest was something. So they did that. But negotiations did not even start. That had less to do with the lack of seriousness of the latter, but with problems in Flanders itself. In 1379, the revolt of Ghent broke out. Now, the city of Ghent was rising up against the Count of Flanders. Relations between the Count and the city had been fraught for a long time. Because the Count had sided with the King of France during the Hundred Years' War, which had a detrimental effect on the ability to import wool from England. English wool was critical in the production of cloth, which is what had made the Flemish cities rich. 
and the city of Ghent had therefore previously revolted in 1338 and had established an independent city government that signed treaties with England. But in 1345 the Count had brought Ghent and the other rebellious cities back under his control. Fast forward to 1379 and revolt broke out again. The trigger was that the citizens of Bruges had been allowed by the Count to build a new canal to the sea to protect their rapidly silting harbour. And as work progressed, Ghent citizens attacked the workers from Bruges, killed the bailiff and then burned one of the Count's castles down for good measure. Things escalated and within weeks weavers all across Flanders had taken up arms against the Count. What followed was a brutal war between several of the cities, including Ghent, Bruges and Ypres on one side, and the Count and his French allies on the other. A war that devastated the richest county in all of Christendom. In 1382, the Count defeated the cities at the Battle of Rusebeck, which led to a series of reprisals against the leading citizens who had supported the rebellion. Only Ghent still refused to surrender and the war dragged on for another three years. Bottom line was that most of the foreign merchants had left Flanders by then to avoid getting killed in the crossfire. The end of 1382, only about 20 Hansards were still holding out in the devastated city of Bruges. One of the reasons the war ended with a peace agreement was that the old Count of Flanders had died in 1384. His incredibly rich county went to his son-in-law, the Duke of Burgundy, Philip the Bold. Philip needed to urgently rebuild the economy of Flanders in order to fund his participation in the Hundred Years' War. He therefore entered into negotiations with various cities, but also with the Huns, about the return of the German merchants to Bruges. The Huns thought they now had the upper hand and demanded the restoration of all their ancient privileges, plus an exorbitant compensation for lost business. And on top of that, they demanded that Philip would erect a chapel of atonement for the imprisonment of the Hansa merchants in 1378, as well as having three masses sung every year to commemorate those who had died during the revolt. These demands, in particular the one about the chapel, went too far for the Duke of Burgundy. Even though it hadn't been him who had imprisoned the merchants, it was still his honour that would be diminished by such an atonement chapel. I'm not quite sure what it was that made the Hanse to put forward such an obviously impossible and economically irrelevant demand. In part, this may have been to gain a bargaining chip that could easily be sacrificed. Could also have been because the Hanse itself was divided. Lübeck and the Wendish cities were pursuing a hard line against Philip, whilst Danzig and the Teutonic Knights advocated a more conciliatory approach. This rift within the association shows that the Hanse was by no means a monolithic organization. They could align behind one purpose and maintain tight discipline, as they had done during the war against Denmark. But it wasn't something the Hanse cities were usually comfortable with. The Confederation of Cologne, you know that agreement that they had all signed in the build-up to the war with Denmark and that demanded strict compliance by all members, had run out in 1385 and had not been renewed. The Hanse was not a league of cities or a permanent alliance, but something much looser held together by cultural ties and common interests, not a command and control structure. And an outright commercial war with Flanders was not in everyone's interest. So, when negotiations with Philip of Burgundy collapsed in 1388, the cities came together on a Hanse tag to debate whether or not to place Bruges under embargo again. The Wendish cities did win the support of the majority, but only by a thin margin. So, the embargo was declared and the merchants in the contour of Bruges left the city to settle in Dordrecht in Holland for the time being. And the terms of the embargo were even stricter than in 1358. All trade with Flemish merchants was prohibited. Even entering the prohibited zone without goods was to be punished. Goods arriving had to carry a certificate of origin. Anywheres arriving from Flanders in any Hanseatic port had to be confiscated, even if they had come with a neutral ship. Previously, the rule had been just to send that contraband back. But, and there is a big but, the Wendish cities had to make material concessions to the Prussians to get their approval. Danzig, Elbing, Tor, etc. were allowed to trade amber with Flanders freely. 
They were also allowed to import cloth for the Teutonic Knights' robes and even go to the market in Brabant. And there were the Dutch cities like Kampen that were even more reluctant to comply. They saw a great opportunity to benefit from a major smuggling operation by allowing clandestine grain ships from Danzig to unload in their harbours. The laxity of the blockade meant that the embargo lasted a lot longer than last time. Only after four years did the parties agree. The Hansards had to drop the demand for the chapel and cut the damage claim to £11,000 of silver. In return, they got a few more privileges, in particular improved protection against piracy. By the end of 1392, the merchants of the Contour of Bruges returned. Again, the Hansa triumphed over the greatest trading city in their world and one of the most powerful territorial lords on the continent. But the success already rang a bit hollow. Even before the Hansards returned to Bruges did the local merchants vow not to let these foreigners gain any more headway. The new ruler of Flanders was no longer just a count, but also the Duke of Burgundy, whose lands extended into northern France and down into actual Burgundy and Holland. That means next time the Hansards want to move their contour elsewhere in the Netherlands, they will find it more and more difficult to escape the clutches of the Duke. But most concerning was the constant breaking of the blockades. This unveiled internal disagreements between the cities whose economic interests had begun to diverge. Flanders wasn't the only flashpoint for the Hanseatic League. England was another. King Edward III, the great friend and sponsor of the Hanse, had died in 1377. Even by the end of his reign, the relationship had cooled off a bit. Gone were the days when the German merchants went out of their way to save his majesty from the embarrassment of having his crown sold at auction to the highest bidder. England had for centuries been just a producer of wool that was sold to the cities of Flanders, where it was weaved into cloth. The merchants who had a monopoly on selling this wool were the aforementioned Merchants of the Staple, a trading association established by a royal charter in 1319, but probably even older. This monopoly forced others who wanted to participate in England's most important industry to look for ways to get around these restrictions. And what the monopoly of the merchants of the staple did not cover was the finished product, i.e. cloth. There was surely some form of cloth industry in England before the 14th century, serving mainly local demand. But by the 1350s, this industry began to scale up. The reason was probably threefold. One was a simple profit motive, as the splendid guild houses in Ghent, Ypres, Bruges and later Antwerp make abundantly clear, there was a lot of money to be made in cloth, a lot more than in just producing wool. The second was the disruption in the trade with Flanders caused by the Hundred Years' War. As we just heard, the Count of Flanders and then his successor Philip of Burgundy supported the French, hence England would often stop the export of wool to Flanders. And that meant the wool producers in England needed to figure out what to do with all that excess wool they could no longer sell. So they began to make cloth themselves. And finally, there are these ambitious men who did not get a seat at the Merchant of the Staples Hall and they opened up export markets for English cloth. They called themselves the Merchant Adventurers. There is still today a society of merchant adventurers in York whose splendid guild hall is well worth a visit. By the 1350s, these merchant adventurers had beaten a path into the Baltic, travelling the long way around Jutland. Their English cloth was cheaper and often easier to obtain than the Flemish product. The return journey was profitable too, as there was a lot of demand in England for wood, grain and copper. The harbours the merchant adventurers preferred to sail to were Elbing, Danzig and Stralsund, rather than Lübeck. They were often well received by the Teutonic Knights we had close relationships with the English aristocracy. Because British knights would come down to Prussia for sport during the years when the Hundred Years' War went into a lull and opportunities for their favourite pastime, fighting, murdering and pillaging, had become scarce. Now the English merchant adventurers rented houses and market stalls and just generally made themselves comfortable in their new home. Soon their business expanded into the great herring market in Scania. 
being great sailors, and fairly close, they travelled to the Bay of Bourneuf in Brittany to load up with salt, then turned round and headed for Falsterbo, where they bought and pickled the herring, which they then later sold back home or in Flanders. When that started to bite into the profits of the Teutonic Knights, and in particular the merchants of Gdansk, they turned against the English. After the war with Denmark, the Hanse had gained control of the Öresund and could therefore simply bar the merchant adventurers from coming in. Sounds like a solution to the problem. But wasn't. Because in return, the English now made life difficult for the Hanseatic merchants in the steelyard in London and their other contours along the east coast. Once King Richard II had assumed the throne, the pressure increased even further. Other than his father, Richard was much more amenable to listen to his own subjects' complaints against the foreign traders. So, upon Richard's ascension to the throne in 1377, the Royal Council refused to confirm the Hanse's privileges unless certain conditions were met, including the preparation of a definitive list of Hanse members. The latter was wholly unacceptable to the Hanse, as that would have forced them to take on a much more corporate structure with fixed membership and permanent institutions. And finally, the English had the audacity to demand reciprocity, i.e. they wanted that the merchant adventurers were granted the same rights in the Hanseatic cities that the Hansards enjoyed in England. How dare they! The initial reaction was diplomacy, as per the usual playbook. The new Bürgermeister of Lübeck, Jakob Plesko, travelled to England and, after long and arduous discussions, received the confirmation of the old privileges. But that was just a piece of paper. The king still introduced new taxes on the steelyard merchants, which they refused to pay on the basis of their ancient rights. And generally, the treatment of the Hanseatic merchants in England remained harsh. A Prussian envoy to the court of St. James lists the following complaints. In 1375, a Danzig citizen had his ship and contents confiscated by a baron called Edward Le Dispenser, and when he claimed redress, his claim was rejected three times. In 1379, a ship was held for eight months in the harbour of London, losing its owner a hundred pounds sterling. In 1381, a ship ran aground and the locals took away its entire load, worth 600 pounds sterling. In Scarborough in 1983, the locals accused a German merchant of being a Breton traitor and refused to pay him for the goods he had sold and handed over. And then the most outrageous incident happened in 1378, when another Danzig merchant was murdered together with his three shipmates by soldiers on an English Navy ship. We can be sure that similar complaints were made by the English merchant adventurers about their treatment in the Baltic harbours. Things escalated further until in 1385 an English fleet attacked German merchantmen in the harbour of Bruges. Six of these ships belonged to the Teutonic Knights. And so the Grand Master of the Teutonic Knights immediately declared an embargo on England. To avoid having their goods confiscated, the merchant adventurers therefore rapidly left Danzig and Elbing and hankered down in Stralsund, where they initially found a friendly welcome. But there was still no redress to be obtained for the various complaints. The city of Stralsund therefore, in agreement with the other Wendish cities, confiscated all the English merchants' goods, at which point Richard II confiscated all the goods in the steel yard. We are in the year of 1388. It's the year where the Hanse had just declared an embargo against Flanders. And the Teutonic Knights in the Prussian cities, who might have been much less keen on an embargo on Flanders, but were very, very keen on all-out war against England. Jakob Plesko, Bürgermeister of Lübeck, and his colleague from Stralsund, Wolf Wolflam, were dispatched to England to negotiate. Now these two can be credited with avoiding a most likely disastrous military engagement. Even though the Hanse was still full of the glory of the recent success against Denmark, these two men and their colleagues on the city councils were hard-headed merchants who were used to measure risk and return. They could think beyond the already massive military challenges posed by an attack on England to the impact such an action could have on an organization as fluent as the Hanseatic League. And at the same time, there were astute negotiators who could bluff their way through a royal council of noblemen. So they made their threats of imminent military intervention sound credible, whilst at the same time keeping their demands within the range that would not humiliate the king and his council. 
This time, there were no calls for the construction of a Chapel of Atonement. And with this, an agreement was finally reached. The confiscated goods were returned and the existing privileges for the steel yard were again confirmed. In return, the merchant adventurers were given the right to trade in the Hanseatic ports, even to trade ship to ship with other foreigners. Who won in this contest is a bit of a debate. Yes, the Hanse managed to retain their privileges in the steel yard without having to grant full equivalent treatment to the English. But in the long run, the deal was probably more beneficial to the English than to the Germans. The merchant adventurers established a permanent base in Gdansk, their own guild hall, and they elected a governor. They went well beyond the agreement of 1388, formed corporations with Hanseatic merchants and offered their goods to retail customers. So in 1398, the Grand Master of the Teutonic Knights had enough and unilaterally cancelled the agreement with the English crown. But nothing came of it. In 1398, the League was no longer prepared to get into a fully-fledged fistfight with England. And that left the legal situation in limbo. Trade between England and the Baltic continued, but without an overarching legal framework. Things depended a lot on circumstances and goodwill. Complaints kept going back and forth about how the English prevented the Germans from exercising their rights and how the Hanseatic cities imposed petty restrictions on the merchant adventurers, such as banning them from bringing their wives along. This will go on and on until the closure of the Stahlhof in 1598. Now, to complete our stories of the embargoes in 3088, we need to mention the conflict with Novgorod. The contour in Novgorod was the first the Hanse had established and it still accounted for much of the export in furs and beeswax. But conflict had existed for quite a while, caused mainly by the Teutonic Knights. Now, the Teutonic Knights weren't members of the Hanseatic League, but they exercised a significant influence over it in their role as true overlords of the Prussian cities, as well as thanks to their own trading activities. For the rulers of Novgorod, the Teutonic Knights and the Hanseatic League were largely synonymous. So every time the knights expanded from their holdings in Latvia and Estonia at the expense of the Republic of Novgorod, the Novgorodians retaliated by confiscating the goods in the St. Peterhof. Tensions kept escalating and by 1388 the Hansetag decided to put Novgorod under embargo too. Given the League had shut down trade with England and Flanders, the two major export markets for furs and beeswax, the incremental damage to their trade was limited. It was almost free. But again, the blockade wasn't super tight. Still, Novgorod caved. A new trade agreement was signed that confirmed and detailed the respective rights and privileges, and that agreement held for almost a century. But what we see with all these embargoes in that 18 years after the great victory over Denmark and the peace of Stralsund is that the coherence of the Hanseatic League has started to come away at the seams. The Confederation of Cologne is not renewed. The cities, namely Lübeck, Rostock, Wismar and Stralsund on one hand, and the Prussian cities plus the Teutonic Knights on the other, have different economic interests that drive them to demand diverging political positions. And we have not even talked much about the wavering cities like Kampen and Bremen, who are notorious for their blockade-breaking. Next week, we'll talk about another chapter in 14th century Hanseatic history, one that's probably the most famous. I obviously mean the story of the Victual brothers, the notorious Baltic pirates, and their last leader, Klaus Störtebecker, whose last walk is part of Hamburg folklore. I hope you're going to join us again, and quite frankly, why wouldn't you? It's pirates! And now, before I go, let me explain to you how the show works. You're currently listening to a podcast about the Hanseatic League. All these episodes you get here are also available on the main podcast feed under History of the Germans podcast. This episode is episode 117 in this main podcast. So, if you enjoy this show and you want to hear more, go over to the History of the Germans podcast. We've already covered the Ottonian Empire in episodes 1 to 21, the Investiture Contest in episodes 22 to 42, the reign of Frederick Barbarossa and his immediate predecessors in episodes 43 to 66, the time of the civil wars between Welf and Hohenstaufen and the reign of Frederick II in episodes 70 to 94, and the history of the great stem duchy of Saxony 
in episodes 95 to 107. And as you've heard in the beginning, the history of the Germans and all its offshoots are funded entirely by the generosity of our patrons. So, if you feel it's worth supporting this effort, go to patreon.com slash historyofthegermans or to my website, historyofthegermans slash support and make either a one-time donation or sign up for a monthly or yearly contribution. If you do the latter, you get access to occasional bonus episodes, but mostly you're supporting the show. If Patreon isn't for you, you can also support the show by helping raising its profile. The best way to do this is to tell family, friends, strangers in the street, simply anyone, that you love the show. You can do that face-to-face or on social media, and if you want to link to my content, I'm on Twitter under at Germans History and on Facebook under at Pod. All the links are also in the show notes. 